romance of the ranchos. San Gabriel, 1837. Town upset by Scotsman's romance with Indian girl. San Gabriel, 1842. Ranchero buys ship for trading venture. San Gabriel, 1852. Ranchero pleads for Indian reform. The Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles presents The Romance of the Ranchos, a weekly dramatization of the great personalities and momentous events which produced our California of today. Each week, our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, returns with another true story of the romantic, adventurous days of the dawn. How long will the war last is the number one question in all minds, in Washington and throughout the country. Nobody knows the answer, not even the best informed experts, not even our president. But one thing we all do know is that the faster we build planes and tanks and guns and bombs, the sooner we can bring the war to a victorious conclusion. And the sooner the victory, the fewer American lives will be lost. So once again, Title Insurance and Trust Company reminds you to buy defense bonds and stamps, all you can afford as often as you can, as a business investment and as an investment in America. And now here is our wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, to tell us the story. Buenas noches, señoras y señores. Tonight's story is one that touches the heart of everyone, for it's the romantic story of a young Scotch adventurer who fell in love with California and with one of her beautiful daughters. The characters are famous, for in the fictional story of Ramona, Helen Hunt Jackson used these people as a basis for her story. This is the true story of Don Perfecto Hugo Reed and his Indian wife, and of their life at San Gabriel and Santa Anita. It's a tale rich in the romance of the ranchos. Our story begins far from the sunshine of Southern California, in a little town in Scotland about the year 1828. There, a young man was talking with a lovely Scotch girl. I think it will be best that you didn't call again. Victoria, you can't mean that. You you can't mean that you don't want to see me again. Aye, Hugo, it is for your own good. I didn't want to hurt you, but it will hurt you less this way. But, Victoria, I don't understand. I... Oh, how can I just go away and not see you again? I love you. You know that. Ah, Hugo, that's why it will be easier for you to go. For I, I do not love you. Oh, I know, but in time, Victoria, perhaps you'll change your mind. No. Before I love another. No. I can't believe it. I'm sorry, Hugo. I, I can't believe it. Hugo, do not feel so badly. Very soon you'll forget me. Someday you'll laugh and say, I couldn't have thought I loved that silly Victoria. Never. Ah, you shall. You're young. What does age to do with it? I'm a man. I can know love as deeply as any man. Aye, Hugo. And I thank you for your love. I don't want your thanks. But that's all I can give you. I'm sorry. It's better this way, Hugo. Believe me. All right. I believe you. I'll go now and you'll never be bothered with me again. Hugo, wait. Do not talk like that. What are you going to do? Does it matter now? Of course. We can be friends. Friends? No, Victoria. No. This is goodbye and forever. Hugo, what are you going to do? I'm going away, far away, as far as I can go. No, Hugo, dear. You may not do that. You must get back to college at Cambridge and forget me. No, I'll never go back. I'm through with everything. I'm going away, starting a new life somewhere, far away. Hugo, you may not take it so hard. You'll find another girl. Fall in love with her. I'll never speak again of love for a woman unless that woman is Victoria. And now, goodbye. An unhappy romance sent young Hugo Reed out into the world of adventure. He shipped aboard a boat bound round the horn and presently was working for a fellow Englishman in business in Lima, Peru. 
His employer's name was Henry Dalton, the same Don Enrique who was to establish the Rancho Azusa many years later. In the summer of 1832, Hugo was running Dalton's branch store in the mining town of Hermosillo, Mexico. But a casual trip to San Pedro aboard the rig Ayacucho opened the young man's eyes to a new and promising land. And in 1834, Hugo Reed and his friend, Dr. William Keith, arrived in the Pueblo of Los Angeles to take up a new life. Hugo formed a partnership with Jacob Lease and started a mercantile store, carrying everything from cartwheels to silk shawls, anything the trading vessels that plied the coast would bring. Soon, the young Scotsman's business was flourishing. He was becoming a man of influence in the community. His store was a mecca for the ladies of the best families, and so it was that one day, a stately old lady in a black lace mantilla visited the shop. She was Doña Eulalia Perez y Damarene, house mother of the great mission San Gabriel. And this shawl. See, I shall take that too. Very well, Doña Eulalia. Uh, will there be anything else? Uh, not this time, senor. I have bought more than I can carry now. Oh, please allow me to carry them out to your carretta. Oh, see, si, gracias, senor. Uh, here, I'll just load up with these bundles and bring them along. You don't get into the Pueblo from San Gabriel often, do you, senora? Often enough. I like San Gabriel better. Uh, see, si, I don't blame you. So do I. You know San Gabriel, senores? Oh, see, si. I visited Padre Sanchez there on my first journey to California. He entertained me splendidly. Ah, oh, see, si. he was a good man. A great man. I agree. And it's too bad that he's no longer with us. See, si, you do not know how bad. San Gabriel is not what it once was, senor. Oh, come. I couldn't have think of San Gabriel as anything but a paradise. Mm, then you have not seen it lately. You must come there one day. I should be delighted. Wait, and open the door for you. Gracias, senorita. Uh, my carreta is over here. All right, I'll just put these bundles in the... Oh. Why, senorita, what is the matter? Oh, oh nothing, nothing except... Uh, I was a little startled. I expected to see an Indian boy driving your carreta, but... Uh... But instead you see a beautiful woman, eh, senor? Well, see, I... Uh... <laughs> oh, come, come, come. There is no need to be embarrassed. Victoria is beautiful. Anyone can see that. Victoria? Did you say Victoria? See? Si? What is so strange about that name? It is a name fit for a queen. Oh, see, si, see, si, of course. And in this case, if I may say so, the name fits perfectly. It's only that I... Well, I knew another... See, si, the name was well chosen. For Victoria would be a queen among her people if the Spaniards had not come. She is the daughter of a great Indian chief. Here, uh, uh, Doña Victoria, I present to you, Senor Hugo Reeves. It's indeed a privilege, Doña Victoria. Buenos dias, Senor. Uh, I'm uh, uh, sorry, I, I don't look very presentable. <laughs> oh, nonsense. You young people. The sight of a pretty face and you lose all trace of self-possession. You are quite <laughs> presentable, Senor. I am happy to know you. Well, thank you. Uh, gracias. It's my pleasure, I assure you. Come, come, Senor Reed. We must be off. You'll have plenty of time to pass the time of day with Doña Victoria when you call for tea at San Gabriel. Oh, gracias. Gracias, Doña Eolalia. I shall be most happy. Very well, then, senor. Buenos dias. Buenos dias, senorita. We shall expect you. Uh, si, si. I shall be there. Gracias. Buenos dias. I'm most happy to have... <laughs> si, I I'll be there all right soon. <laughs> Ah, buenos dias. It is you, Senor Reed. Si, buenos dias, Doña Victoria. What brings you to San Gabriel? Yeah, the same thing has brought me twice before this week. <laughs> Can't you guess? <laughs> Senor. That's it. I love to see you smile. That slow, warm smile of yours. May I come in? Si. But I am afraid that Doña Eulalia is not receiving just now. She is taking siesta. Well, that's what I was hoping for. I didn't come to see her. <laughs> there, I've made you smile again. <laughs> uh, you're not laughing at me. No, senor, I am not laughing at you. Won't you sit down? The garden is much nicer at this time of day. Yes, it's lovely here. Uh, oh, <laughs> won't you sit down, too? Si, gracias. And now... What shall we talk about? About you. Ah, oh, no. I am not an interesting person. Oh, but you are. You're fascinating. Uh, 
I've inquired among all my friends, but I can find out very little about you. <laughs> there is not much to know. I am Indian. When my father's village was taken over by the mission, I came to live in the church school. I was brought up there. Doña Eulalia became fond of me and brought me to live with her. I have been here ever since. You're happy? See, as I should be. I am fortunate. Much more so than most of my unfortunate people. See, I know. But come, senor. Tell me something of yourself. Oh, no. no I, I'm not an interesting fellow at all. <laughs> oh, but you are fascinating, <laughs> as you said of me. Uh, then <laughs> we're both fascinating <laughs> eh? to each other. Uh, but I won't bore you with my life. Oh, senor, I'd like to know more about you. You, you really would? Well... I was born and raised in Cardross, Scotland. Oh? That's a beautiful little town, all fertile and green. I was happy there as a boy. Then why did you leave? A girl, and oddly enough, a girl named Victoria. Victoria? See, si. she threw me over for another man. Oh, senor. So, you ran away. Well, now, to tell you the truth, I wanted to see the world anyway, so it was a good excuse. Mm, not you, senor. You did not feel that way then. How do you know? I know, senor. For in you... The feeling is deep. You do not take such things lightly. You see through me easily, don't you? Not see through, senor. I understand, see. Yeah, I know. Uh, somehow I think I understand you, too. You know, there's <laughs> something about you... Uh... I am easily understood, senor. But we were not talking of me, we were talking of you. The senorita named Victoria drove you away. See, si, and I've been a rolling stone ever since. But now... But now you are going to settle down. See, si, I think so. <laughs> it begins to look like another girl by the name of Victoria may do that for me. Oh, oh dear, I almost forgot. I must tend to the children's feeding. Children? Are there children here? Si, senor, my children. You, your children? And I knew you'd been married once, but... Well, I don't understand. I was afraid you did not, senor. We have three children, my husband and I. I am sorry, senor. For a time, Hugo Reed's world was toppled about him. And added to this hopeless love came more trouble. His partner, Jacob Lees, was of a quarrelsome nature. And things were going badly at the store. It finally became necessary to liquidate the business. This was a bitter blow to the young Scotsman. I thought I was going to make a fortune out of it, Bill. At least enough to buy a rancho, become a ranchero. Not this time, Hugo. And not at all in this town, if you ask me. I think we'd both better head south again. South? You mean back to Mexico? Yes. We'll get along better there. You know that. Not me. I'm staying here. This is where I want to live. Uh, I'll make my way here yet. Why do you want to stay, Hugo? Well, because I like it. I like everything about it. The climate, the country, the people. Uh, one person in particular. Isn't that it? I don't think so, Bill. Then I know you better than you know yourself, Hugo. Why don't you give it up? You're only making yourself unhappy here. Come with me to Mexico and forget her. Forget her? Well, perhaps you're right. I don't know. Perhaps I'd better go. And so Hugo Reed left the California he loved, went back to Mexico, and spent an unhappy year there. But one day, he received a letter from one of his friends in Los Angeles. There has been nothing unusual. There has been one of the regular smallpox epidemics among the Indians. Many died. And, oh yes, there was one you may have known. His name was Pablo Maria, and he lived with Doña... Eulalia Perez at the mission. He was the husband of the Indian woman, Doña Victoria. Bill! Bill, where are you? Yes? What is it, Hugo? What's the matter? Bill, I'm going back. Back to California. Back to California raced Hugo Reed. Back to San Gabriel and Doña Victoria to comfort her in her misfortune. But as the months went by and her loss was fading into the past, Hugo found the courage to speak. Victoria, perhaps I should not ask it yet, but, well, you must know my feeling for you. You have been the truest friend I have known, senor. More than a friend, Victoria. I hope. I love you. Oh. oh, I've loved you since that first day I saw you. I want you to marry me. Oh, senor. Hugo. 
But I am not of your race. What does that matter? You're the most wonderful person I've ever known. And I love you. Victoria, hasn't your feeling for me been more than friendship? See me, querido. In these last weeks, I have come to depend upon you. I do not know what I should ever do without you again. Oh, Victoria. Then you will be my wife. See, si. si, me, querido. I will. Recently, a woman came to an officer of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles with a problem, which she stated as follows. My brother and I, she said, each owned an undivided half interest in a business lot. To avoid the cost of probate proceedings in the event one of us died, we each executed a deed to the other and placed both deeds in a joint safety deposit box. It was understood that when one of us died, the survivor would destroy the deed which he gave and record the one in favor of himself. My brother died last month, she continued, and I want you to record this deed to me and issue a policy of title insurance. This the company declined to do. Now, if this woman had consulted her attorney before making the arrangement with her brother, he would have told her that both deeds were void. He would have told her that a deed must be delivered during the grantor's lifetime and that the courts have declared to be invalid deeds that are given under such arrangements for the purpose of avoiding probate. Suppose that this deed had been recorded and that you had purchased the lot from the woman relying upon the deed as passing title to her. Well, suppose further that the heirs of the brother successfully established an interest in the lot upon showing that the deed was void. You would have no assurance of recovering your investment unless you had obtained the protection of a policy of title insurance. This is but one of the numerous off-record hazards against which you are protected by a policy issued by the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles. <laughs> With his marriage to Dona Victoria, Hugo Reed gained not only a wife, but a new country, for he had to be naturalized, a new religion, for he had to be baptized a Catholic, a new name, for he was now called Don Perfecto Hugo Reed, and three lovely children from Victoria's former marriage. In addition, his dreams of becoming a ranchero were to be realized, for as a dowry, Victoria brought him a small 128-acre rancho, La Puerta del Cuarte. A short time later, he petitioned for, and in 1841, received the great 13,000-acre Rancho Santa Anita. Don Perfecto and his Indian wife settled down to the life of the typical ranchero with ease and grace. And Hugo, who had once been a schoolteacher in Mexico, gleefully began the job of teaching Victoria's children. But this was to cause the first friction between the pair for... Hugo! You kept those children indoors studying for three hours this morning. See, si, mi querida? We were reading about the Spanish islands. Uh, the Sandwich Islands, I should say. And they were fascinating. But, Hugo, it is not right for them to stay cooped up so long, reading, straining their eyes. Nonsense, Victoria. Don't you want them to be educated, to know something about the world? See, si, but they can learn it other ways. I can remember my days cooped up in the mission school. I will not have that happen to my children. I want them to be free. I want them to be out in the air, in the blessed sunlight. Of course, my dear. We'll hold our classes outdoors whenever the weather permits. Oh, Hugo, you do not understand what I mean. I do not want them to have to study so much. It will hurt their health. Oh, very well, Victoria. I'll cut down on their lessons. But I must say, I think you're being a little foolish. Foolish or not, that is the way I want it. Then that's the way it shall be. <laughs> Slowly, other troubles beset the Scotsman. Gradually, he tired of the uneventful life of the ranchero. In spite of the lovely domain he managed, his thoughts turned to other lands, the sea, and wanderlust grew. One day... I've done it, Victoria. The deal is made. I've bought the Esmeralda. It is what you have wanted, is it not, Hugo? Oh, see, she's a grand boat. Just a thing for the Pacific trade. I will make a fortune with her, Victoria. I am glad for your sake, Hugo. When will you send it on a first voyage? Right away, leaving Friday. So soon? But who have you gotten to take charge of her? Who will be the captain? The captain? Right. I will be, of course. You? You do not mean that you intend to save. But of course, Victoria. I thought you understood that. No, no, Hugo, no. 
You cannot go away. But, my dear, it'll only be for a while. A few months, I'll be back. A few months? Hugo, you have grown tired of me, have you not? Victoria, how can you say that, my querida? I'll never grow tired of you. I love you. I always will. Oh. This may be my chance. My chance to make my fortune. I have to take it. But I'll come back to you, my love. Come back to you in triumph. <laughs> But Hugo did not come back in triumph. His voyages on the Esmeralda didn't bring him the fortune he had hoped for. Instead, he returned to find more trouble. His absence had done no good to the ranchos. He needed money to rehabilitate them. Then, too, the Indians at San Gabriel were causing trouble. For after the power of the Padres was broken, the Indians were pushed aside by the whites. Reed, as an official of the district, was called upon to help solve the situation. And he spent much time and energy on the plight of his wife's people. But in vain. Finally, in 1846, he saw a chance to remedy both problems. The Indians and his. He brought the news to Victoria. So you see, I've decided to sell Rancho Santa Anita to Henry Dalton. But Hugo, that would leave us with almost no land except this house. No, for Governor Pico has agreed to sell us all of the ex-mission lands. We can help the Indians to restore their homes and still have plenty left over for ourselves. But... How can the governor do this? He has the power, and he needs the money. I'll pay him for war. War? See, with the Americanos. It comes close, querida. Oh. But it's going to be a blessing for us, for we receive a great rancho. Hugo was wrong. He sold his rancho Santa Anita. But after the Americans took over California, he tried to claim his mission lands and found he could not. No, Mr. Reed, I'm sorry. That grant the Governor Pico made you is not valid. He made it when he knew that California was lost. He gave it to you just so it wouldn't fall into our hands. But it was public lands, and it'll stay public lands. The United States government will not declare your claim valid. Hugo Reed was desperate now. He was without lands. He had no means of supporting his family. Then, suddenly came word that seemed like the answer. It's gold, Victoria. Gold. They've found it up north at Sutler's Mills. There's millions to be had for those that get there first, and I'm going to be one of them. No, Hugo, do not leave me. I must, me querida. I must. This is my chance. Then, while Hugo was far away in the gold fields, the greatest tragedy came. Victoria's lovely young daughter, called the Flower of the San Gabriel, a beautiful Indian girl who was the pattern for Helen Hunt Jackson's Ramona was taken sick with smallpox. Far away in the north, the loving stepfather got the news. Maria Ignacia died this morning. No, no, it can't be true. No, no, no! Victoria. So... You have come. I got here as soon as I could, me querida. Do not touch me. Victoria. I am glad you got here too late to see her in her grave. I am glad. Victoria, what are you saying? You killed her, Hugo. You made her study and read. You kept her cooped up in the house out of the sunlight. You killed her. Victoria, me querida. Oh, I know this thing has been a terrible shock to you, but surely you cannot mean what you I said. I do mean it. I hate you, Hugo Reed. I hate you. You killed her. Her brain affected by grief, Victoria madly accused her husband of murdering her daughter. Sadly, Hugo went back to the north, miserable in his double tragedy. But happily, the cloud passed, and once again, Victoria was the kind and gracious woman she once was. So it was to her welcoming arms that Hugo Reed came back from the north, weary and discouraged. It's all over, Victoria. I'm broke. Everything's gone. Our lands, our money, everything. Not our home here, Hugo. And we have each other. Me, Carida. Nothing else matters when I hear you say that. Mm. Oh, I've been such a fool, Victoria. I could have been so happy if I just stayed here with you. I do not know, Hugo. I do not think so. You are you. You did what you had to do. I, I haven't been a very good husband, have I? Oh, can you forgive me? There is nothing to forgive, Carida. You have given me something I would never have had otherwise. Love. Love for a fine man. No, Victoria, not a fine man. What have I done with my life? 
but bring you sorrow. I've done nothing worthwhile. But Victoria, now, before I die, I'm going to do something worthwhile. It's something that needs to be done. What is it, Hugo? I'm going to do something to help your people, oh. the Indians. I'm going to write about them, and you're going to help me. Oh, We're going to make people understand what has happened to them and why. We're going to make people realize that they were not always degraded and poverty-stricken as they are now, that they were once happy and unspoiled, that they can be again if we'll only help them. See, si, see, si, mi querido, you shall do it and I shall help. And then the world will see that my husband is a great man. Feverishly, Hugo Reed worked over his Indian letters, which were published serially in the Los Angeles Star during a little time left. At 42, he was an old man. His health was failing fast. But he finished just a series of 22 letters which furnish us today with the best picture we have of Indian life of this section before the coming of the white man. And his passionate plea for help for the red man aroused sympathy and led eventually to action on their behalf. But Hugo Reed was not to see his triumph. For on December 12, 1852, he passed from this world. Great was the morning in Southern California, for they knew, as did Victoria, that Hugo Reed was a great man. And in far-off San Francisco, the newspapers joined in the chorus of praise. And praise for an excessive actual accomplishments. His death is a deep loss to all of California, not only for the great project which he left incomplete, his campaign on behalf of the Red Man, but for his great knowledge and humanity, which would have been of inestimable value to California in the long period which lies ahead. All California mourns at the grave of Hugo Reed, a great pioneer and a great man. And at a lonely grave in the Pueblo Cemetery stood a solitary figure, stately and tall, a woman still lovely and unmarked by the years. Adios, my husband. With you goes my heart. Next time that you're in the neighborhood of Santa Anita Rancho, stop in and visit the house that the hero of tonight's story built for his bride and children a hundred years ago. The Hugo Reed adobe still stands beside a lake on the rancho property, and it's open to the public. There are other mementos of the famous rancho's early days there, too, including Lucky Baldwin's famous coach house and horse's burial ground, shaded by towering century-old eucalyptus and other trees. To you who have heard tonight's story... These surviving reminders of California's golden past will hold a fascinating interest because you know something of their history and the people who originated them. Title Insurance and Trust Company hopes that you have listened to all these programs and that each one has, in a similar manner, made some part of Southern California more real, more interesting, and enjoyable to you. Now, what's the story for next week, Frank? Next week, we'll recreate the story of the marshland, which was also a great port. The story of Rancho La Bayona. That's the rancho which was the domain of the Machados, and the land which is today Palms, Culver City, and Venice. It's a story you'll enjoy. So until then, this is your wandering vaquero, Frank Graham, saying, Hasta la vista, señoras y señores. The Romance of the Ranchos, a presentation of the Title Insurance and Trust Company of Los Angeles, featuring Frank Graham as the wandering vaquero, is dramatized by John Dunkel and produced by Ted Bliss, with special music arranged by Irwin Yo. Bob Lamond speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcast.